Hi everybody, welcome to the first vodcast in our molecular genetics unit. Uh, in this first one, we are going to take a look at some of the stories and the history behind the discovery that DNA is in fact the heredity material. Our whole last unit was about inheritance and about how traits work their way from one generation to the next and how they express themselves. Well, in this unit, we're gonna actually look at the stuff that is that heredity and what genes really are and how they actually code for those traits and what that means as far as coding for things like proteins and how that molecular machinery really works. So this is where we get really, really fun and I couldn't be more excited about sharing this with you guys. So in this first one, we're going to talk about a few stories and a few of the stories behind the DNA mystery, if you will, since Mendel first figured out that those tiny elements move their way from one generation to the next in his pea plants. And um, there's a few excerpts I'm going to read, um, too, and it's from this book, which I'm hoping you guys can see. Um, it's called DNA, The Secret of Life, and it is by James Watson. Um, I highly recommend it. If you can get your hands on a copy, um, it's marvelous, and it talks about just uh, the whole gamut of how we got to find out about DNA, their role in it, the, the advent of biotechnology and genetic engineering, and kind of throws out some questions of where we go from here. So it's well, well worth the read. Um, and so without further ado, let's get right into it. So the search, okay, for since Mendel found his pea plants, right, it and found out how things were passed on, there was this desire to really get into um, what that actual tiny element was. And towards the late part of the 19th century, it was discovered that there was this material inside the nucleus of a cell um, that had acidic properties and it, so hence nucleic acid. So DNA was found. And then we started seeing that there were chromosomes and these chromosomes though weren't just DNA, they were DNA wrapped around proteins, which we know now are histones. So um, if you guys remember that, you know, the, the DNA is coiled around proteins. So the big million dollar question was, which one's the heredity information? Is it the DNA or is it the protein? So that's really what got the ball rolling. And for many scientists, it was, they were all about, hey, protein. Protein is, you know, complicated and it's big and there's all these options for it. And while they didn't know the structure of DNA at the time, they did know that it was, the, the, the material that made it up was simple. And so there was no way that something so simple could possibly be the molecule of heredity. So enter Frederick Griffith in the 1920s. Frederick Griffith was a doctor. Um, he was very interested in working with soldiers who he had seen through World War I um, die of infection, um, and it was very frustrating. So he decided that he wanted to create, and you know, not only in just well, infection, but other ailments like pneumonia and all these things. So he was looking at vaccines, and that's really what he was studying. He you know, this idea of genetics and his eventual role in this story was never his intention. And so he, in the 1920s, wanted to create a vaccine and he wanted to create this vaccine for pneumonia. So he testing, you know, one of the things about vaccines is that when you get a vaccine, you're either getting some strain, some dead of what the original um, infectious agent was. So that way your body creates its immune system and it creates the defense mechanisms in case you come across, you know, the bad stuff down the road. So in developing these vaccines, he had to create experiments to kind of test this, right? So he used two forms of pneumonia bacteria because that's what he wanted to find his vaccine for. And he used a virulent form, and this is the rotten form. I mean, this one, virulence refers to how quickly it's going to make you really sick or, in fact, kill you. Something highly virulent, you're done. Okay. Something non-virulent, oh, you might get the sniffles, but you're going to, you know, this is something you can bounce back from. So 
he used two forms of this bacteria, virulent and non-virulent strains, and he set up this really, really neat experiment. Okay, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the experiment and I'm gonna walk you through it, okay? And if you need it, grab your textbook because diagram on page 208 has this as well. So feel free to grab your textbook and have this out. So if you need to pause, go for it. So here's what he did. All right, he took um, a test tube of living virulent strain. Okay, so again, remembering that the virulence, the rotten kind, okay? Um, and it was considered basically um, what we called smooth. And then we have rough, okay? Um, okay, so he takes this virulent strain, loads it up into a um, syringe and injects it into a bunch of mice, okay? So he's got his mice group, right? You know, all the mice here, they die, okay? Not really a shocker, it was virulent, right? Figured that. He takes a non-living strain, so these are his controls, takes this non-living strain, throws that up into a syringe, shoots up the mice here, and yay, happy mice, okay? All these mice live, cool. So now he knows that the virulent kills the mice, the non-virulent, and notice this a virulent as well as what's called. A in front of a word reverses it. It's, it means the opposite of. So that's why you see something like symmetrical, asymmetrical, sexual, asexual, virulent, avirulent. And these, and these mice survive. Control's done. Now let's start having a little fun with the experiment and see if we can't create some kind of vaccine. So, so, this bacteria, so this bacteria has been killed by heat, right? Well, remember what we've been talking about, high heat, think about what that does to proteins, you know, all of that stuff. So he jacks the heat way up, fills up the syringe, and shoots it into the mice. Cool, okay? Now, one would expect if these bacteria have that, that shouldn't bring any harm to the mice. And it doesn't, the mice do survive. All right, expected so far. So now this is where we can start to try to create the actual medicine. And he then takes the heat killed virulent here, combines it with these guys, hopefully to elicit a immune response from the mice so that if he were to go and then, you know, um, expose the mice to the virulent kind, they would be protected. Okay, so there's the theory, there's the hypothesis, right? So far, so good. Well, I have, in this case, living mice. Living mice, I would hypothesize that if I combine these two and inject it into the mice, they would live too. Well, he goes and he does this, and uh-uh, big old dead mice, okay? Every single one of them. So he takes this, combines the two, right? Every mouse dies. Whoa, okay, so that was surprising. What the real surprise was, was when he actually checked out what killed the mice. When he goes in and, you know, cuts open the mice, doesn't, you know, I can imagine little, you know, mouse autopsies, goes in and cuts open the mouse, he finds that these mice are riddled. What killed them was they were full of virulent bacteria, living virulent bacteria. Okay. Uh huh. Okay, that was the big thing. Uh, what? Uh, how's that possible? Because he did not inject living virulent bacteria into these mice. He injected dead bacteria, the virulent kind, and living avirulent. So what the heck? So he determined that something had been passed from the dead bacteria to the live bacteria that altered the heredity characteristic or the traits, right? Well, that's a heredity characteristic, the traits of the non-virulent. And he referred to this as a transforming factor. Something jumped. Okay, so what's really cool is nowadays, um, we know that bacteria are notorious for taking up pieces of DNA. We're actually gonna do this in a lab. Isn't that cool? All right. So bacteria will take up these pieces of DNA, incorporate it into their own genome. And so what these bacteria were doing, the avirulent kind were taking up the floating around DNA from the, from the bad, the virulent kind, incorporating it into their DNA and creating that very 
um, crazy protein coat that goes on the outside, which makes the virulent very virulent. And so as they replicated and, you know, and as they were dividing and going through and creating more of them, those few that had taken up that really, really, uh, that, that, those genes were dividing, 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 and all the subsequent generations now contained this protein and were in essence all virulent. Wow. So he never actually found the, um, you know, the key to it, but, you know, and the fact that this is DNA, but what he did find was that there is something inside these bacteria, which we know bacteria are prokaryotic, they've got ribosomes in them, they've got DNA, you know, they've got cytoplasm, they've got protein, they're pretty simple in terms of what's in there, so there's not too many choices, and showed that something was altering these bacteria. From the book, I just want to share this with you that James Watson wrote, um, you know, and say hello to Jim. Though this transformation phenomenon seemed to defy all understanding, Griffith's observations at first created little stir in the scientific world. So even though he did this, people didn't even blink an eye. This was partly because Griffith was intensely private and so averse to large gatherings that he seldom attended scientific conferences. Once, he had to be virtually forced to give a lecture. Bundled into a taxi and escorted to the hall by colleagues, he discoursed in a mumbled monotone, emphasizing an obscure corner of his microbiological work, but making no mention of bacterial transformation. Luckily, however, not everyone overlooked Griffith's breakthrough. And thank goodness, because that person was Oswald Avery. And Oswald Avery took Griffith's experiment to the next level and showed that this factor is DNA and not protein. And he did this by duplicating Griffith's experiments, but in the test tube. And so Oswald Avery is a pretty important factor in this whole story but he too wasn't really met with a whole lot of you know fanfare or hoopla because there were so many scientists who you know basically threw out the idea that it was DNA but he really did show this by doing it in the test tube and he was able to really you know basically break all of these bacteria down and be able to show this by removing, you know, the different other options. And those bacteria were taking up the DNA and becoming the virulent kind, okay? And even though he did this, and this is such an amazing contribution to our genetic history, um, as far as the history of, you know, I guess modern genetics, um, he wasn't really recognized for it. In fact, he, should have received the Nobel Prize and never did. So again, another little excerpt that I find just kind of, you know, fun little stories here. Avery missed out on more than the opportunity to defend his work against the attacks of his colleagues. He was never awarded the Nobel Prize, which was certainly his due for identifying DNA as the transforming principle. Because the Nobel Committee makes its records public 50 years following each award, we now know that Avery's candidacy was blocked by the Swedish physical chemist, Einar Hammerstein. Though Hammerstein's reputation was based largely on his having produced DNA samples of unprecedented high quantity, he still believed genes to be undiscovered class of proteins. So this guy was all in the protein camp and kind of basically blocked Avery's nomination for a Nobel Prize. In fact, even after the double helix was found, Hammerstens continued to insist that Avery should not receive the prize until after the mechanism of DNA transformation had been completely worked out. Avery died in 1955. Had he lived only a few more years, he would most certainly have gotten the prize. And that's because in the early 50s, between Watson and Crick and this next experiment and story I'm gonna share, we put the nail in the coffin and we really sealed the deal. So it, the, I guess, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. you know, we, we 
thank Avery for his contribution because this really set the stage and um, he didn't go completely unnoticed nor did Griffith and you know thank goodness we might have been taking a lot longer to figure this stuff out you know um, as we went through all right so in the 1950s and particularly the very early 1950s because it's 1952 when Hershey and Chase actually um, you know give uh, their talk and show their discoveries and they go and use bacteriophages so here they are okay and it's you know Alfred Hershey Martha Chase and these are two scientists um, who work at Cold Spring Harbor Lab um, and that's where they were doing their work and bacteriophages are viruses and they're very specific viruses that only um, infect bacteria hence bacteriophage okay so that's with it now why working with them was so ingenious is because they're as easy as it comes we want to seal the deal on is it DNA or is it protein let's use something that only has DNA and protein <laughs> and a virus is perfect for that because that's all they are they're a combination of either DNA or RNA and they have some RNA too and protein or lipoprotein that's what they are here is a picture of the bacteriophage that they used. Isn't it crazy? It looks like a spaceship, right? And what these bacteria do is they land, or excuse me, the viruses land on the outer surface of the bacteria and they shoot their DNA to the inside. We didn't quite know that at the time. We just knew that somehow when they infect, something goes into the bacteria turns the cell into this virus making factory and out blasts new viruses so what they wanted to figure out was well let's tag or label the protein and let's tag or label the dna and we'll track it as it goes through the infection process so here's actually this is pretty neat this is a you know a transmission electron micrograph of these um viruses landing on the surface and look they've landed and you can see them there's the head and there's the dna coming down through and being injected into the cell which is so cool so they go and label protein with a radioactive sulfur why does this make so much sense dna doesn't contain sulfur nucleic acids so if I look at the two combined, right, protein, that has, um, so we will do a little pro here, protein has carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, we know that. It has nitrogen and it has sulfur. Those are the five of the six main elements. Nucleic acids, on the other hand, contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So one distinctive difference, if I can label the sulfur, I know I'm only tagging protein, I'm not tagging DNA. All right, so when they do this and they radioactively label the protein, um, the protein coat is now labeled with that radioactivity, the DNA is what's put in. And when they, you know, kind of shake it down, okay, um, and I'm gonna have an animation of this for you to see, they put it in, and what they found was that there was zero radioactivity inside the bacteria. They also then do the second experiment, but radioactively labeling the DNA by labeling, you know, radioactively labeling phosphorus. Okay, so those radioactively labeled phosphorus, they find go into the cell, and when the cell divides, they actually find that radioactivity inside the bacteria. So, backing it up. When they radioactively label the sulfur of the protein, they find none in the bacteria and the subsequent new viruses that are created. Zero radioactivity. When they radioactively label the DNA inside the bacteria, they find the radioactively labeled um, DNA and in the subsequent viruses that then happen. This is also diagrammed in your textbook on page 209. So I'm just going to kind of end this with a final little, little segment here. Um, and again, this is 1952. 
The next vodcast is going to lead us into Watson and Crick's story. So I don't want you to forget about these guys, Crick and Watson. They play such a big role in this, obviously, as does Morris Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin. Hershey, as well as Salvador Luria, went on um, later on to actually win a Nobel Prize for their work on viruses. I have no idea why Martha Chase wasn't included in this, but um, she wasn't. Um, so we're going to end the story there with saying that by 1952, as Watson and Crick are beginning their work on the structure and wanting to figure out the actual structure of DNA, we have found out that the actual molecule of heredity that carries the information to make us what we are is carried in the DNA molecule. So very exciting. and. Um, I really, really hope you guys enjoy this unit. We're going to get into a lot of really neat stuff. So take it easy, have a great night, and we'll see you guys in class.